Welcome to everyone who has joined us. We're delighted to have you with us for a terrific and timely webinar today. We'll have three spotlight presentations. The first is evidence-based recommendations from the Community Preventive Services Task Force. That's the team and task force perspectives. And then the second is Creating Activity-Friendly Communities, a new recommendation from the task force. And the third is on Disseminating Evidence for Action. And then uh, following the uh, presentations, we do have time for questions and answers with those of you on the phone. And at the end of the webinar, we'll just have a, a couple of updates on NCORE announcements. We'll also be live tweeting during today's webinar. If you're on Twitter or other social media, we encourage you to join the conversation using the hashtag ConnectExplore and following the Twitter handle at NCOR, N-C-C-O-R, and on Facebook at NCOR.org. Our speakers today are Jamie Chiriki, Christopher Kozlitsky, and Ross Bronson. Chris uh, is a senior advisor to the Physical Activity and Health Branch at the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at CDC. He will share background on the purpose of the task force and the community guide and the history and need for relevant community guide physical activity recommendations. Jamie is a professor of health policy and administration and co-director of the Health Policy Center in the Institute for Health Research and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health. Jamie will highlight the task force process and deliberations. And Ross is the Bernard Becker Professor of Public Health and co-director of the Prevention Research Center at Washington University in St. Louis. Ross will share approaches for translating and uh, disseminating research findings into practice. Now, to start things off, we'd like to open with a very brief poll. You can submit your answer directly on the screen right now. And this is to identify who is with us today. OK. Well, it looks like we have a good range of folks. And uh, this should also help our speakers. Thank you so much for uh, that quick poll. OK, let's move on. I'd like to turn it over to Jamie for our first Spotlight segment. Again, it's on evidence-based recommendations from the Community Preventive Services Task Force, the team and task force perspective. Jamie? Great. Thanks, Elaine. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Well, thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, as Elaine said, I'm going to share with you information on the task force and our deliberation process. Chris will actually reveal the big news, which is the actual recommendation. So don't hang up after me. Make sure and stay on for everyone else, too. Um, the task force is an in independent, non-federal, uh, unpaid panel of public health and prevention experts. We have 15 members, typically serving about five years. The task force prioritizes topics for consideration, ranging from a wide range of topics throughout the um, community-based preventive services approaches. Uh, the task force oversees all systematic review projects conducted. Um, and uh, we ultimately produce recommendations and identify evidence gaps to inform decision making by decision makers at all levels, government as well as non-governmental entities. Um, this is a list of the task force members in 2016, and the three people highlighted in red, including myself, were actually part of um, the uh, physical activity coordination team that was involved with this review, although I should note that I came on at the very end of this review being completed, um, so I wasn't actually part of the original deliberations. Just for those of you who are not familiar with how the task force works, um, uh, what you may be familiar with in the field um, is the community guide. The community preventive services task force is the one that actually produces the community guide recommendations. So the recommendation that Chris will be sharing with you today is the actual community guide recommendation that came out of the task force. The task force prioritizes topics for review work. A coordination team is formed um, that's comprised of staff um, from the community guide branch at CDC as well as uh, task force members such as myself, as well as other um, uh, experts in the field, which I'll show you the uh, coordination team for this project in a minute. 
The coordination team will evaluate the evidence and provide input on the review. They'll conduct the review itself, the search for the evidence, they'll identify intervention studies, meeting criteria. If you're familiar with systematic review, the, the staff are the ones who do everything from, uh, from A to Z. Uh, the task force just provides input um, and uh, reviews and uh, approves the final review, identifies issues requiring additional work, um, and really works on helping to translate the evidence, um, excuse me, um, into conclusions that can be used by the field. Ultimately, the task force issues a finding statement that's posted to the Community Guide website, and we develop manuscripts uh, to go along with the recommendation statement. So this was the actual coordination team that was involved with that review. As I noted, I came in uh, towards the end of that. But Ross Bronson, who will be our third speaker today, uh, was one of the key external partners on this review and is a former member of the task force as well. Um, from start to finish, the review process really sort of goes through several steps. Um, for this particular review, uh, the task force uh, narrowed the review down to um, key studies uh, uh, focusing on built environment interventions in combination, which Chris will talk about further. Um, the task force identified um, that we wanted to focus on a broad range of study designs for evidence, the evidence base here, and I'll explain why in a minute, and include a wide range of study comparisons for the review. The goal was to weight uh, longitudinal evidence over cross-sectional, um, and I'll explain why in a minute, but we considered both um, as key evidence. The key primary determinant um, uh, for the task force decision was evidence on effectiveness. Once that was determined, then uh, the task force identified the most common combinations of built environment interventions um, across the built body of evidence to support more specific guidance. You may be familiar with the framework um, uh, published by Tom Frieden uh, back in 2010. Um, the pyramid argues that really important interventions for public health tend to be the ones at the base. So for this review, improving the built environment is a great example of changing the context or the environment to make individual default decisions, such as the decision to be active, a healthy one. Task force projects have always included, and some topic areas prioritized, review work on policies and projects fall into the base of the pyramid because um, these are important population level approaches. Um, uh, when you consider the evidence available to inform assessments on effectiveness and recommendations across a range of interventions, you see a number of different trends. Studies of clinical and uh, clinical interventions commonly employ traditional randomized controlled trials or before after designs whereas the ones that typically used in the task force reviews are the ones towards the bottom, natural experiments before, after, and cross-sectional designs. This review included both. As I mentioned before, um, the task force uh, really prioritized demonstration of effectiveness um, and then uh, the combination of interventions um, and study designs as well. So uh, if um, a task force recommends um, a strategy as being effective, there's strong evidence of effectiveness or sufficient evidence. Um, if they recommend against, it's strong or sufficient evidence against it. And then insufficient evidence doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just typically means there isn't enough studies to make a sufficient determination or there's a mixed body of evidence in the field to make a uh, sufficient determination. But typically it's often because there's limited evidence available to review. Um, for this review, um, uh, background work uh, focused on, we identified a number of mixed findings from existing reviews looking at any one specific built environment characteristic. The task force therefore requested that the review focus on interventions that are most likely to influence physical activity. And the coordination team, which remember is comprised of staff as well as external partners like Ross, as well as task force members and NIH and CDC uh, partners. The coordination team proposed looking at evidence for activity-friendly environments in the built environment when implemented in combination. So conceptually, the combined approaches more, are more likely to influence activity, um, and they lead to multiple influences to change physical activity behaviors. Overall, um, the review uh, included um, 90 studies at the end um, uh, that was considered um, uh, for consideration. For longitudinal studies, there were um, 16 studies that were reviewed, um, and then you can see the bulk of the 90 studies were cross-sectional or comparison studies. You can see on the longitudinal studies, most of them were infrastructure construction improvement projects, whereas on the cross-sectional studies, most of them were some type of assessment of the built environment. Task force deliberations on the evidence really honed in on the evidence um, relative to the cross-sectional studies meaningfulness in terms of magnitude of impact, 
the extent to which the measures of physical activity were self-reported versus objectively measured, um, and issues related to selection and replacement bias. Um, the longitudinal evidence, as I said before, was based on 60, 16 of the 90 included studies, and this table here summarizes the findings from those 16 studies. As you can see, there was favorable evidence governing um, studies related to transportation-related walking and biking um, outcomes, and uh, there was mixed evidence related to recreational-related walking and biking, and um, moderate, um, favorable evidence regarding other to moderate to vigorous physical activity, but it was only two studies. Regarding the cross-sectional studies, um, sorry, uh, this table here um, covers all 90 studies, including the cross-sectional studies. So as you can see, we have very consistent evidence on transportation, walking, and biking um, outcomes. Um, and we have uh, favorable evidence within, within the cross-sectional studies, in particular related to neighborhood comparisons and summary score studies across the board, across all outcomes. The review was initially open to consideration, considering evidence on any combination of built environment interventions designed to support uh, physical activity. Almost all the included studies explored um, variations on combinations across transportation infrastructure and land use and environmental design changes. Um, so the recommendation emphasizes these combinations of studies. Some limits on the recommendation. Um, the available evidence provides sufficient evidence to support a recommendation, but there are definitely important gaps in our understanding related to the impact of activity-friendly changes in the built environment. Um, the studies didn't provide enough comparative evidence to be more specific, such as identifying specific intervention combinations as being more or less effective. Um, and additional evidence on the effectiveness of coordinated approaches won't necessarily replace the importance of doing local level needs assessments and local level resources needed to uh, uh, implement these interventions in combination. Other important evidence gaps, uh, we have face this issue a lot with regard to policy environmental change strategies. There's very limited evidence, as you saw, related to longitudinal study designs with concurrent comparisons. We also need studies with longer follow-up periods. There are very limited follow-up periods in the review. Um, and more importantly, uh, uh, or uh, additionally, excuse me, um, studies that include objectively measured physical activity. Most of the studies included in this review were based on self-reported physical activity. Um, and then finally, studies reporting on physical activity changes in absolute or more user-friendly metrics, such as uh, measurement of the time spent phys being physically active, things that uh, uh, the end user can relate to. At this point, I'm going to turn it over um, to Chris, but just a reminder um, to put your questions in the chat box located on the right-hand side, and we will answer them after Ross completes his presentation at the end. Thank you. Thank you the, uh, for having me today. So uh, now that Jamie has covered the basic process, I'm going to lay out the, the groundwork of why CDC was interested in this particular intervention area and in the process that the task force and the community guide uh, goes through. Um, one of the basic needs that the task force and the community guide serves is to provide a trustworthy response to emerging science or new challenges. Uh, in addition, once initial evidence is identified, it must be periodically refreshed and re-examined, and that's what this particular review represents. Um, and most importantly, and Ross is going to cover this in more depth in his section, um, the findings and recommendations are meant to be used by practitioners and policymakers in the real world. And we have to keep that in mind, um, because if nobody uh, makes any changes, then the whole, whole effort is probably for naught. Um, so um, two things um, basically gave us the, the impetus to move forward with this recommendation. The first is that uh, the task force is required to re-examine previous recommendations periodically, and there were two previous recommendations based on a much smaller uh, evidence pool um, that recommended street scale interventions and community scale interventions, but didn't go into much detail beyond that. Secondly, in the intervening 10 or 12 years since those recommendations came out uh, in 2005, um, the Surgeon General has issued a report um, calling for uh, more walking and walkable communities, and the National Academies of Science, Science 
um, two of the specific academies, the Transportation Research Board and the National Academy of Medicine, uh, issued a report, Does the Built Environment Influence Physical Activity, that uh, laid out the science at that point, but particularly called for additional research and particularly interdisciplinary research between public health, urban planning, and the transportation communities. Um, so what we at CDC are looking for from the task force and through the guide is um, the credibility um, that the process uh, affords us. Uh, it is intended to be used by decision makers, both elected and uh, appointed um, decision makers, to uh, focus limited resources and um, attempt to, to work in areas of critical public health need um, in the directions that are most likely to produce impact. And that's what um, we were hoping to get out of this particular review. Um, the, the recommendations can focus on a specific disease, uh, or as in this case, a particular protective factor, physical activity, as well as the environments that either serve as a facilitator or barrier in these processes. Um, the community guide previously was actually a physical volume, but it has grown uh, as well as the technology has grown such that you can see that now it is a web-based um, system that not only has the recommendations themselves, but a, a number of additional supportive um, resources for implementation. Um, the latest review of the evidence uh, was, as I said, uh, building on the previous review from 2005 that looked at street scale and community scale interventions. And in particular, it looked at policy design and program changes at the community level that would either support transportation, uh, utilitarian walking, cycling, uh, transit use, or recreation, or both. And so now I'm going to start to give the big reveal. I know some people have been like, when are they going to get to the actual recommendation? And that's now. So the definition that the uh, work group used is here. Um, and uh, it is a, a fairly unique um, examination because a lot of the, the recommendations don't delve into other sectors like urban planning or transportation engineering. But um, the environment and policy work that happens in those, in those arenas, uh, it turns out, is very important towards um, creating physical activity promoting environments. Um, I want to go through the, 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 the meat of the recommendation, because uh, as I think Jamie mentioned, it, it is a um, multi-component intervention that basically uh, has a number of elements that deal with the routes that the uh, transportation or recreation physical activity takes or the destinations. This first uh, table here lays out some of the detail uh, of the route-related interventions, uh, things like connectivity of streets and trails, the presence of sidewalks, uh, traffic calming devices that, for those who may not know what that is, things like speed bumps um, and uh, in various enforcement measures represent uh, traffic calming. Uh, infrastructure like bike lanes, as well as the presence of transit infrastructure, bus or subway systems, and the supportive infrastructure that goes with them. Uh, so the recommendation says that you basically need to either uh, conduct a, a section of your intervention that relates to this, or if you already have routes that are supportive of physical activity, um, then you can move to the second part of the recommendation, which is, has to do with the destinations. And that's what this table covers. Um, so uh, I'm an urban planner, so mixed land use is a term I'm very familiar with, but for those who don't know, uh, this particular lingo. Uh, land use basically is whatever is taking place in a particular um, space. It can be residential, it can be uh, office space, it can be commercial, it can be parks, and all kinds of other things. So what the, the recommendation found is that um, 
you need to address both the roots of the physical activity and the destinations of the physical activity. And that's the second half of the recommendation that is unpacked here. Um, so you need to have a mix of land uses. Um, there needs to be enough density uh, of, of people, residential and otherwise, uh, such that um, it can support mixed land use. The, the destinations need to be um, what, what I often call at the human scale. They need to be proximal enough that, um, that it, human beings can choose to walk or bike. Uh, if things are far enough apart, you're just not going to. And then, of course, we all like having green space, parks, and recreational facilities in our communities. Um, I, I'd like to point out that one of the, the real hallmarks of this particular review is that um, unlike the two previous ones, which just said things at a street scale or things at a community scale um, are likely to increase physical activity, this one, because of the depth of the evidence base, was able to, um, to provide much more detail, which we hope will, ha will help practitioners as they operationalize it. Uh, one of the things that, that I wanted to, enter, uh, to point out, and then this is what the task force is so valuable for, is that there were over 61,000 papers identified that dealt with built environment and transportation related uh, infrastructure and physical activity. And most practitioners at the grassroots level are never going to have time to sift through those and figure out where the real uh, strength of the science is. So that's what this process hopefully uh, uh, allows for. Also, because of the depth of this particular research base, we were able to, to discover uh, a variety of uh, study designs and a significant uh, sample size that was able to uh, create a much more robust recommendation than that which was available in 2005. Um, so the specific community guide recommendation uh, is that built environment strategies is to combine one or more um, interventions to improve pedestrian, bicycle, or transportation systems in combination with one or more land use and environmental design interventions are um, likely to be effective in increasing physical activity. Uh, the one thing I wanted to emphasize here again is that you don't have to necessarily uh, start from scratch in both of these um, intervention areas. If you have good destinations, then you can focus on adding the, the, the route support. If you have really good routes, then you can, uh, in fact, focus on the destinations. Um, all of this comes back to uh, how CDC at, hopes that we're going to use this in partnership with a number of people. Uh, one particular new inter, uh, initiative that we're undertaking is called Active People Healthy Nation. And uh, it has several components that are on the screen currently uh, delivering programs that work. It is absolutely critical that we know what is likely to work if it is uh, implemented at the community level. And this feeds into that. Um, mobilizing partners, um, this particular review is important for that because uh, we think that tapping into the science and evidence base from the other sectors will help us communicate to and mobilize the partners. Um, sharing messages that promote active lifestyles, uh, part of tapping into those additional sector uh, science bases is that we have become much more comfortable with the terminology that, that those sectors use, uh, and that will allow us hopefully to um, much more successfully recruit partners into this process. Training leaders for action, uh, we're hoping that, uh, for instance, through our state and local grant programs, that this recommendation will allow us to uh, really get specific um, in terms of the types of interventions that they should consider. Now, keep in mind, one of the things that I think is a strength of this recommendation is that um, it isn't uh, completely prescriptive. Uh, in each community, you have to look at what you have in the way of activity-friendly routes and activity-friendly destinations, and then make decisions from the two charts, the two tables, about what will have the most impact 
in your particular community. And lastly, uh, we hope that the tools and technology uh, that is created will take advantage of this particular science uh, base and the data that underlies that um, to improve um, all of the supportive tools and technology that we have available to us. So with that, uh, I, will also, I will again point out that if you have questions, please type it into the chat box, and I will turn it over to Ross for his section. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, everyone on the line, for joining us in the middle of your, of your busy schedules. Um, so bridging back to Chris's final slide, my last little bit of this, and then we'll open for, for questions from the group, is, is the idea of, of sort of how we better disseminate and communicate um, issues like this task force recommendation and make more use of it. Well, apologies to any, any people who are not baseball fans on the phone. It's, it's the baseball playoff season, and, and hopefully some of you on the line still have a favorite team in the playoffs. My, I do not. The Cardinals are out. But um, if you remember back to some of the famous baseball movies, the Field of Dreams movie, what's the operative um, fra a saying from that that's driving the movie? If you build it, they will come, or if you build it, he will come. And I think that's really a metaphor for how we do public health many times, that that too often we think we'll, we'll build an effective intervention, the, the task force will give a recommendation, and then it will magically happen, that will, people will adopt it, uh, practitioners will use it, policy makers will decide to fund it. And we know from a lot of research that, that it doesn't magically happen like that. And so another, another way to think of it, this is a, this is a takeoff. If you remember the, the famous quote from the philosopher George Berkeley was something like, if a tree falls in the forest, and no one's around to hear it, does it actually make a sound? Um, well, you can think about that the same way as a recommendation like the task force. If the task force speaks in the forest and no one does anything differently, did they really speak at all? You know, did it make any difference? And that's really what we want to think about when we when get to the idea of dissemination, what we know about dissemination, what leads toward a more effective dissemination and implementation. Here's a few things. We know a lot more than this, but here are a few key points about dissemination implementation that comes across um, what now is about half a century of research uh, going all the way back to Ev Rogers' work on diffusion of innovation. One is that passive approaches to dissemination largely don't work. Um, it isn't just you build it and they will come. You have to build it, promote it, market it, uh, strategically target it, do a lot of other things. Um, the second one is sort of around the idea that um, multi-level approaches, ecologic approaches, work a lot better than single source prevention messages. That is really epitomized in this, in this current recommendation that really is sort of a multi-level, multi-sector approach. Uh, stakeholders matter is the third one. Uh, we need to involve stakeholders not only in the research process and evaluation, but also in the dissemination process. And then the, the next one, which I'm going to elaborate more on in the next few slides, is the idea that dissemination needs to be targeted, tailored, and made specific to different audiences and the ways that different audiences uh, receive information. Um, we've sort of mocked up a very simple, this really comes out of communication science, but this is a very basic dissemination model that really you could apply to any of your work. Um, we published a version of this in an open source article that I put at the bottom of this, and if you're interested in this, is a, it's a free online article. You can just Google it and pull it down. Um, the idea here is you start with a source. Um, that might be the task force. It might be one of you who has decided it's important to disseminate a, a bit of information like this task force recommendation. You move over to the right-hand side and you have the audience. Um, the person you would like to uh, have received the information, that might be a practitioner. It might be an urban planner. It might be a policymaker. You decide what the message is. The message might be the recommendation or some packaging of the recommendation in a user-friendly way. And the channel is how you reach the person. Do I, do I sit and talk with them? Do I pre prepare a, a, a policy brief? Uh, do I uh, conduct something via mass media? And so thinking more systematically about dissemination is really important. The audience is essential. Um, you can see here. What we want to say isn't always what people are interested in. We're looking for that kind of magic uh, part in the middle. Um, 
You would need to understand your audience, uh, their position, their background. Um, what do they care about? Is it a is it a policymaker who really cares about this issue, or you're going to first need to convince them of the importance of of physical activity or the or the increasing uh, prevalence of obesity as a driver of healthcare costs. Um, what are their information needs? How do they usually receive information? How do they ha like to package information? Will they read the task force report, or will they only read short pieces of information? Uh, where will they get? Where will they gather that information? Um, where, when, and how do they seek that information is along the same lines. And then also, what's your ask? What do you want to do this, with this information? So if we're thinking about the task force recommendation, um, are you seeking to change uh, the priorities in the public health programs that you fund? Are you seeking to implement a new intervention that's based on the task force uh, recommendation? Or because this recommendation is so much focused on partners across disciplines, maybe it's, it's to engage new partners who don't always have a stake in health and health-related um, intervention. This one gets at some of the characteristics of audiences, um, and this uh, characterizes in the middle column a practitioner uh, compared with a, a policymaker. I want to just go to the bottom, and that is that a practitioner like you, about 40% of you on the phone, I think, um, would receive information through evidence reviews, experience from the field, your personal experience. A policymaker more likely would do things from real-world stories, um, their own constituents, uh, gatekeepers, uh, the party priorities, what's going on in the media. Science would be part of that, but science probably would not be at the top of the list for this. So those characteristics are really important to keep in mind. Here's sort of typically how the task force thinks about audiences and their recommendations. This first bullet this really summarizes that they think very broadly of the audience. I think a communication scientist would, would probably argue that that's too broadly in thinking about communication and dissemination. Um, the scope is not only people in public health, but it's people who are connected to public health in different ways. And of course, the guide weighs a lot of different factors, including the match between a community's needs, the, the resources, people's prior experiences, what the local data shows, what's been done in local data before, and especially for policy-related issues, a political will as well. This is the message. Um, the nice thing I like about this is it's a one-pager. Um, if you go on the, the Community Guide uh, website, they produce these really nice one-pagers or, or two-pagers, one, one of the two, uh, that really summarizes the key parts and if you look at the bottom part of this, that's what I would call kind of the active ingredients within this task force recommendation. If you think of the channels, kind of that, that middle lower part of the, of, the, of the dissemination model, this can be through the website. Um, that's a fairly passive form of dissemination. It could be through more active communication from task force liaisons. It might be a presentation. It might be publications like peer-reviewed journals. Again, that's a fairly passive way of doing it. And then it's, then it's engagement with a whole variety of different partners. And I'll wrap up with just a few examples of, of, of initiatives and, and a few examples of how this task force recommendation has been or pieces of it have been and how it can be even used more so in the future. It can be used in master planning. It can be used in a whole variety of different zoning initiatives at the local level. Many complete streets initiatives are going on now. It can inform those and enhance those. It connects to school and youth through safe routes, through school siting policies. It connects up to building codes and building designs, and then in many forms of economic development. I'll give you an example in just a minute. Task Force has used this at the national level. Um, Previous recommendations have connected up with Healthy, Healthy People 2020. It's used a lot in grant making. I know a lot of the practitioners on the line are well aware that a lot of the grant making uh, program announcements, the funding announcements require use of community guide recommendations. And this one, I'm sure, will be built in those as others have been. It can inform best practices across many different initiatives. And you can see a few examples there. Another example, a specific example, can be through land use. Um, 
zoning here. And you can see an example here um, around this is this is building off some work that Jamie had done and, and making uh, neighborhoods more walkable, uh, form-based codes. This is kind of an implementation guide. I like to think of the community guide recommendations as the what to do, and then the next step of those is the implementation and the how to do it. And that's what guidebooks like this can provide. Here's one on complete streets. Here's a hands-on guide to complete streets that will tell more about that. And many of the many of the components of the community guide recommendation here would be in, built into this as well. And then finally, economic development. You can build um, more vibrant communities. You can make the case for for economic advantages of, of these sort of um, walkable and bikeable communities, and that can also be a really nice enhancement to the usual community guide recommendation. And so I'll wrap up um, with one of my favorite cartoons that I think is always necessary for researchers like us to remind us that we're not doing research only for the sake of research. Um, we want to do something with all the research, and that's that's why those of you on the phone are so important to this kind of work. And so. I'll end there, and I'll hand it back to Elaine to moderate some discussion. Thank you so much, all three of you, Jamie, Chris, and Ross. This has been wonderful, and it's exciting now to think about how some of this might be used. And there is a question here from Jonathan in Indianapolis for Chris. Um, and, and everyone on the phone, remember, you can also um, type in questions you might like to ask any of the speakers. So, Chris, the review recommends combined interventions. As you mentioned, though, many communities may already have one or the other or something related to both. So what does it really mean for a community already embarked to follow this guideline more closely? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think the answer it sort of comes down to this. We know, and it, it's it's pretty straightforward. I think it's um, simple to recognize that you, in order to get around in an active way, you need uh, safe routes to do it in. But what the, si what the research is telling us is that, um, that the routes by themselves are not necessarily enough. One of my former bosses that many of you guys might know, Richard Jackson, uh, used to have a presentation that he called the 13 Steps to a National Never Walk Campaign. And some of the um, some of the slides that he would show were all the sidewalks that just ended. It, they ended in a telephone pole or they just ended in the middle of somebody's yard. And so they were sidewalks to nowhere. So clearly, having a sidewalk or a bike lane is necessary but, not, but potentially not sufficient. Uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, on the other side, having destinations is critically important, but if you just have the destinations, the, the science tells us that people will go to those destinations, but they'll most likely drive. So it's really important to recognize that it's the connection between the routes and the types of routes and the activities and the destinations that you are uh, seeking. The importance of this is Selecting from the first table and selecting from the second should really be an integrated process. If you're going to have shopping, um, then you might want to have paths that support um, one set of um, physically active transport. And if you're going to have offices, it might be another set. Um, so the the routes and the destinations really are an integral choice. But as we all want to emphasize you don't have to do both. If one of them is good, then selecting the appropriate uh, item from the other table uh, can reduce the amount of resources you need to, to successfully create more physical activity. So that's great, Chris. And there's a follow-up question about this elephant in the room that communities are in a position. They may have done something on one or the other, but their position about uh, trying to retrofit uh, existing urban communities. And the, the question says, uh, the route making for biking and walking means clawing back infrastructure long designated for auto use. So how do we best address the pushback from auto users to sway the conversation? Or that could also apply to um, other a pushback on other um, decision making. Um, well, first uh, I'll point out that there's been some data collected that indicates that um, teenagers 
and young adults in the current gener generation are uh, behaving radically differently than I did. When I was 16, I wanted to get my driver's license the very second the DMV opened. Um, but apparently fewer and fewer uh, uh, adolescents and young adults are seeking driver's licenses. So it's possible that we're going through an evolution where th the pushback won't be as extreme. Um, the other thing that I have found is that I think people have a per perception in their head when they hear certain terms like density or road diet that if they're presented with an actual um, drawing or picture and, and they are asked, Do you, does this appeal to you? A lot of people discover that uh, a boulevard with a median strip with um, with landscaping in it, it, it appeals to them. Um, even if that um, that boulevard median strip represents traffic calming, it, it depends on how it's presented. But the, the reality is that even in, in parts of the country where this kind of pushback was believed to, to be um, extreme, and I'll hold up Tennessee as an example, Nashville pointed out to its citizens that the epidemic of childhood obesity was something that was going to have uh, implications for all of them and that they needed to come together to find the solutions to this particular problem. So I do think that if, if public health and, and clinical folks can really paint a picture of why physical activity is important and get people to recognize why they're not physically active, that potentially their, um, their environments around them are not supportive of them getting safe physical activity in the time increments they have available to them, um, maybe the pushback won't be as strong as it is feared. It sounds, Chris, a lot like what uh, Ross, you were talking about and really knowing the audience and what might, they might see as beneficial. Um, yeah, and I might add just a little bit to that, Elaine. I think yeah. this is Ross. Um, you know, I think that I remember some of the early uses of the Open Streets Initiative, the Ciclovia and Recrovia in uh, Bogota, Colombia, and other cities around the world now. And there was a lot of resistance to that early on, that it was going to make it inconvenient for cars, and you're closing streets on different times. And over time, those initiatives have become very popular, and they found that there's actually economic benefit. So I think sometimes it's starting out slowly. It's packaging things very carefully. It's thinking about the early adopters and areas where you can try something out on a small scale and, and sort of packaging in a way that it's a win. There's a health reason behind this, but in, in many of these cases, there can be economic benefits to them and that it's not a, sort of a net loss for somebody, that, that it can be a gain for all people in the community. And I think if there is going to probably be a generational shift, too, uh, that, that Chris mentioned I think is very important. I think it's an important point that you you can't expect to get the whole community turned around at once, that packaging and looking for those early wins so that you can show what progress looks like is really good advice. So we have a question here from Deborah Young, and, and she says, I'm wondering if there's anything that discusses the inclusive design to clarify inclusive to all users regardless of age or ability, not just persons with illness, injury, and or disability. So is that uh, is there anything in the in the um, guide or on the website about um, inclusiveness? Uh, we don't have anything specific quite yet, but I would like to point out that the the infrastructure and the connectivity that is discussed in the recommendation um, really is the kinds of things that support uh, a variety of users. Um, there is a concept that uh, a, a gentleman named Gil Penalosa came up with called the 880 community that basically says if you design and maintain a community to support 8-year-olds and 80-year-olds, then the rest of us will be fine. Um, that the nature of what 8-year-olds and 80-year-olds need um, is, is above and beyond the infrastructure and support that, that most of us otherwise need. So I would point out that if you have human scale design and development that supports people who use both automobiles and who don't use automobiles, then you really are supporting people who want to be physically active for their health, people who may not be able to drive personal automobiles 
because of a, a, a health issue that they may, they may have a, um, a mobility or vision impairment, for instance, and that um, the kind of communities that the, the recommendation supports, I think, are much more universally designed communities because of the nature of the combination of destinations and route design. I'd love to hear if others, Ross or others, have a, a thought about the question as well. I don't have anything specific, but I think exactly what you said is true, Chris, that there there are many uh, parts of these recommendations that I think do support inclusive design, although I think there still um, aren't, there aren't a lot of specific studies that address that. I think the, there's a lot of face validity of these recommendations to support that concept. It, can I add one other thing? Sure. I, it, there is a, a systematic review that a colleague at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, Yohai Eisenberg, published in the last year or so that does look at um, design things at various scales that support um, persons with disability and, and others who have uh, impairments. So I encourage all you guys to, to take a look at Yohai's work. Um, and like I said, I think it was in 2016 uh, that that particular systematic review was done. So thank you, and thanks to Deborah, who uh, has also commented that uh, that she agrees with the 80, um, 880 <laughs> guideline, which is a pretty cool little rule. But sometimes um, she says, I think the concept gets lost in execution. So thinking about how we move from the recommendations into use, um, that's one one uh, one reminder of what we need to be thinking about when we are in an actual community trying to figure out what to do. So a question to all three of you, and it's, it's actually two parts. Uh, the first part is to the public health and other folks who are on this, listening in on this webinar, what, what might be a next step or a couple of next steps you would like for them to take to start to use and disseminate information about uh, the recommendations and how to put them into use. And the second part of the question is, are there tools available? Ross, you showed slides or pictures of different guides. Are there tools on the website that the people on this webinar could turn to to uh, start to look at what they can do? On the second part, I don't think there are tons of tools up there yet, uh, Chris, I believe, but but I think there's a, there's a lot out there. Um, and we actually have more examples that Chris compiled um, of where this has been used. And I think if, if anyone wants more of those, they can email either Chris or me, and we can send those. Um, and I'll take a first go at sort of your, your, broader, your broader question of sort of what next and let others add to it. I think, I think if I'm in sort of a public health practice setting, the first thing I might do is look at um, what, what we're doing right now in, in, in physical activity promotion, you know, building healthy communities, active living kinds of things in, in our work, and, and how what we're doing now fits or doesn't fit with this new recommendation. Because, you know, this isn't the only recommendation related to, to promoting physical activity. There, there's a whole list of other, of other community guide recommendations. And I, I almost think of it as sort of a menu um, when we when we work to, with, with really grassroots community members on this, I usually try to take the task force recommendations and put them into the most plain English possible, get rid of all the, the academic um, jargon and, and reduce it down and, and sort of brainstorm with them and see how does the matching of the priorities of a community match up with what we're doing now and, and how could we reposition going forward. And I think building that into grant applications, if, if somebody's in a state public health agency, for example, they're often doing grants to local agencies. How can they reformulate some of those priorities in the funding announcements that go out that, that fit with these evidence-based recommendations? I think that's a few things where I would start, and I'll, I'll see if, if Jamie and Chris want to add to that. Yeah, the other place I would also um, look, I, amongst all the resources Ross listed earlier, um, Smart Growth America has some really good practical um, uh, material that you can use, particularly for making the case for economic development purposes. Um, and I will just put an advanced plug for 
uh, a primer that I've been working on with Chris's team at CDC that's going to be uh, really honing in on how uh, zoning and land use can be used to facilitate public health and physical activity. Um, and it's really written more for the practitioner and for the public health um, community rather than for planning and land use. So that's forthcoming. We're actually going to do a webinar on that uh, early next year, I hope. Um, the the two things that I'll, I'll hold up, as, as a member of the American Planning Association, um, they have created an entire center within their organization to focus on health issues. So if you go to uh, www.planning.org and look for the Health uh, Research Center, that is one resource. Change Lab Solutions is another group that has a, a, a host of practical resources for implementing a lot of the areas for action that Ross highlighted, the policy, planning, program, and economic development interventions. Thank you all. That's very helpful. And um, I'm sorry we need to move ahead because I'd love to hear more about the, these practical implications. But uh, we're almost out of time. And uh, just quickly, a, a couple of related activities to let you know about. We're really excited at NCOR to be releasing a youth compendium of physical activity uh, launching next week. It shows the energy cost values for different kinds of activities, sedentary, standing, household chores, playing, participating in games, walking and running. So it's very, um, very important as a part of that community planning to look at what the uh, changes in the community will mean for young people and, um, and the um, uh, energy costs. Uh, related to the kinds of activities that are being supported. And so it's a valuable resource that has not been uh, available in the past. So if you sign up for announcements at NCOR.org, uh, we'll let you know when uh, that is released. And just quickly, there are a couple of places to find NCOR upcoming. We'd love to see you at the Obesity Society Annual Meeting Exhibit Hall. Uh, October 31 to November 2 at National Harbor in Maryland. Uh, there will be a session on youth compendium of energy costs for physical activity uh, on the 31st at 10.30 in the morning. We'd love to see you there or at our booth at um, uh, exhibit booth number 224. And also at APHA uh, in Atlanta this year, November 4 to 8, uh, NCOR will be at exhibit booth 627. Uh, and please come and meet us and talk to us about uh, what you need and what we have. And then if you have other questions about NCOR or upcoming activities, please email the NCOR Coordinating Center, NCOR at FHI360.org. We are also on Facebook. Follow uh, us at uh, NCOR.org. Um, this Connect and explore, and all of the uh, webinar and all of our webinars are archived. Uh, this is the website you can see up there, uh, the webinar tab. And so, please uh, let your colleagues know that it'll be available. And uh, if you're like me and really want more time to read the slides, I'll probably be looking at it again. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you to. Jamie, Chris, and Ross, this is so exciting. It just there's so much here for actually sitting down in our communities and thinking about how to make improvements. It's just very practical. 